Hi, Marco. Hi, Sandres. So let's, uh, my first question is, um, what is, to your mind, what is good musical composition? I would say it's uh, something that's uh, very hard, if not impossible to answer. But uh, for me, a good musical composition is somewhat characterized by a certain integrity of the work. And with integrity, I mean that there should be a focus that can be felt, which stays consistent for the composition. And then again, when I say focus, I mean, in a very general sense, some sort of artistic idea. This can be something concrete, maybe even something extra musical, or it can be something purely musical. But uh, I think what characterizes a convincing composition for me is this sort of sort of, yeah stability of such a focus, I would say. Which does not mean that the piece cannot go through many, many different variations and contradictions and all of that, but uh, there should be this sort of common denominator which holds it together in the larger sense. Yes. And what is, uh, looking on your pieces, or to your mind, what is your, let's say, what's your musical idea or signature? Well, I think, um, what is maybe characteristic of me is that uh, many of my works are actually very different from each other, but uh, there are definitely uh, certain ideas uh, which uh, have uh, stuck with me for a long time. And for example, I'm very uh, much attached to live performance. So although I work a lot with technology, I have hardly any fixed media pieces. And uh, so in other words, I'm really interested in the live event, how a performer relates to the music or specifically also when I work with technology, I'm very interested in exploring the relationship between a performer and a sort of technological environment. And um, also, I think it's fair to say that what is characteristic of my work is that a lot of it is audiovisual. So I'm very interested in expanding beyond the normal limits of sound, so to say, and to think in a sort of inter or transdisciplinary way. And um, what's your way of composing? How you start and, and, and what are the stages you go through? Well, that can be very different from piece to piece, but what I can say about the work process in itself is that for me, it's very important to uh, work on pieces very regularly. This is not always possible through circumstances, but uh, uh, it is important for me because then I have the feeling that I'm staying in touch with the piece. And then it's often also working in the back of my mind. But uh, what I also often experience is that it's really important for me to sit, to try to sit down every day and to work on a piece. And on some days it's going to be several hours. On other days it's maybe only going to be five minutes, but sort of to briefly get in touch with an idea to kind of keeping, keep it working in my mind. And another thing which I have often experienced is that of course, there are moments when you kind of run into a deadlock situation when you can't really progress with a certain project. And uh, my experience is that it's especially in those moments important to keep this regularity to sit down again and again, even if it feels like wasted time because you don't make any progress. But this process of sort of banging your head against the wall is very important for the creative process as a whole. And, Usually, after a certain time, the wall breaks and you make some progress. So it's like some kind of creative persistence, right? Yes, you could say so. I think it's just this, uh, I think maybe to put it in different words, it's also to have this sort of uh, a trust that even when sometimes things don't develop in a very good way, that you don't give up, but that you stick with it, you keep trying until something comes out yes yes and and you usually start with some kind of concept or you start with with field work or 
Well, many of my projects do have a sort of extra musical reference. So um, not necessarily all projects, but definitely when I'm working on larger projects, there is usually a sort of conceptual framework that I'm working on. And uh, so in those cases, this is, of course, something which uh, provides a starting point, but also a sort of uh, frame of reference that I keep coming back to. So I would say in general, although not in all of my works, but uh, I do think it's characteristic of my work to work also with extra musical references. And more recently, also something that I have been very interested in exploring is to work with forms of uh, storytelling. And uh, and looking back, right, ten years back, what the, what are the most significant changes in your music? Well, as it happens, uh, I have been busy for uh, several years now with an artistic research project where I've investigated the potential of elements from computer games in audiovisual composition. And uh, I have been running a research project, which has just come to an end, but that one started already in 2016. And before I started with this research project, this is already something which kept me busy for several years. So when you say the last 10 years, I think uh, in the last 10 years, it has been a kind of dominant uh, thing in my creative work to think about um, a, a game elements. Yeah. And this started as a sort of coincidence uh, because uh, I'm, I'm not a, or I didn't I used to be a gamer, but I uh, ended up uh, at the festival where I also performed where by coincidence, two other artists performed something which was game related. And somehow I had the feeling that there was such a sort of freshness and vitality coming from this uh, way of performing that I had the feeling that this is really something I have to take a better look into. And what I find also funny in a way is that uh, on one hand, this whole game world was uh, at that time completely foreign to me. Yeah. I didn't know anything about game culture, but uh, in very different ways uh, also uh, in this uh, interest in gaming, a lot of different strands converged of uh, things that I've been doing uh, in earlier times as a composer. For example, I have had a long period where I was working a lot uh, with different solutions of um, open forms. And this is, for example, something which also came back then in the exploration of game elements. So, it's basically so this is definitely something that was uh, quite dominant in the last 10 years. Sorry, what were you going to say? So just I say understand right that uh, the news, like let's say, it's, it's, uh, the new, the new thing in your music is uh, in your musical interest is this game element, which actually amplified through this research uh, project, right? Can you repeat the last sentence? There was an interruption. I didn't hear it clearly. Just, uh, the idea is to understand the, the game gaming, right? The, is a focus or a new new thing how you new per, new perspective which evolved and which actually was triggered a lot uh, uh, from this um, research project well it's the other way around uh, the the research project was triggered by my interest in games so it was actually a the original trigger came from uh, this uh, experience at this festival, and then I started to uh, use game elements in different compositions. And the, the more I did it, the more I also realized that this has a really vast potential and that it would be fantastic to uh, really explore the different possibilities in a more systematic way in the framework of a research project. And that's when I started to write applications and then eventually I uh, received this funding which enabled me to run this for five years. Uh, interesting. And um, can you just give some kind of uh, example how how these gaming ideas evolve into your music? Sure. Um, it can be in very different ways, and uh, it can be in very obvious ways. For example, I have some pieces 
where uh, I'm very openly working with game references. So I'm also building 3D environments which look game-like and there are performers who have to act according to rules and fulfill certain missions. So in such pieces, uh, it's, uh, the game reference is very obvious. And for example, also manifests in the way how I treat visuals. But I have also realized pieces where the game elements are very hidden. For example, a piece uh, with the title Tympanic Touch. It's a piece for uh, two performers. And uh, if you see it as an audience member without knowing anything else about the project, you, uh, it's likely that you won't even notice that uh, game elements are underlying this piece. However, there is a very strict game uh, um, system which is running the whole thing. And there is also a competitive situation between the two players. And this is in a way driving the piece. But uh, there is also a winner and a loser at the end. But the audience doesn't know anything about it at any point. So the game system is completely uh, hidden. So of course, something what I've been often asked uh, is so why didn't I choose for showing the audience what's running in the background? The reason is very simple, because for me, the uh, game uh, principle is something which is um, characterizing how the piece evolves and how it's constructed, but it's not something which is supposed to be the main focus of attention. So the piece is uh, about different things, uh, sonic characteristics of certain materials, modes of listening, and so on. And I decided not to show the game elements because I uh, uh, thought that it would distract from other things which were more important for me in the piece. Then, of course, a follow-up question was, if the game is completely hidden, why bother with it at all? Why didn't I just write a, a conventional score? And here the reason is, that I believe that the game system very strongly characterizes how the two performers behave towards each other, how they react to each other, how they listen to each other. So I also like uh, in such cases to describe such game principles as a form of chamber music, because what is often characteristic of chamber music is also a very close attention to what your other what the other performers are doing how you relate to them how you coordinate with them and when you're working uh, with game rules in a competitive situation in different ways all these aspects also play an important role so for me the game system was something what was characterizing the piece although it didn't make itself obvious as a game principle yes yes understand and uh, as I understand you use a lot of uh, technology in your work right I do yes so I like to work with uh, electronic sounds and also with uh, visuals light design but also live generated video 3d environments stuff like that and uh, what is uh, let's say what is the most significant for you technological artifact right Uh, you mean what is most uh, significant for me when, when working with technology? Yes, yes. what is the most uh, technology? I don't know. Soft, some kind of software or some kind of hardware or... Well, uh, I use very different setups, but uh, most of the time I use um, digital systems. I have some pieces where I use analog synthesizers, but most of the time I work with digital systems. And... Um, I wouldn't like to single out a single technology, which I find uh, most interesting. But uh, as I already mentioned earlier, I find it very interesting to explore the relationship between live performers and the technological setup. And I think in one way or another, that's probably also a mirroring of the situation we find ourselves in uh, because technology, of course, is a uh, large aspect of uh, everybody's life. And so to explore these relationships is very interesting for me.
<laughs> and for example, if you think in musical terms, you can use uh, electronic sounds as a sort of ex extension of an instrument, but you can also use it as a sort of environment that your sound is embedded in, or you can use it also as something as a sort of second player, almost like a sort of chamber musical situation again. Yeah. So I think it can be very diverse how you sort of relay technology towards a performer or several performers. And um, do you call this well on your own or? Uh, well, well, most of the time. Really uh, program software or? Yes, I uh, usually I code myself, yeah. But, and I use uh, different working environments. I most of the time use Super Collider for sound. That's a very consistent element that I've used for a very long time. And when it's about visuals, uh, it depends on the project. So I often use Unity's open frameworks, uh, whatever is uh, makes most sense for a specific scenario. This is very interesting because this is one of uh, one one common feature what I found out during those interviews that there are quite many composers uh, uh, actually are programming something right so so it means that it somehow programming is some kind of new must have for composer well for me it is definitely um i think when you're working with technology the ab ability to program just gives you enormous creative possibilities because otherwise you're dependent on the technology that has been designed by somebody else and if you basically design your um, uh, working environments yourself, uh, you have the utmost uh, flexibility. And, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I saw a lot of, uh, is it, is it that you have a lot of, uh, very, in, in your work, you use a lot of multimedia and a lot of, let's say, uh, 3D environments, right? It's some of them, yes. Are you, you uh, do you uh, create the, on their own or you have some, some kind of uh, partners or colleagues with whom you work? Well, basically I design uh, almost everything myself, uh, but uh, in certain projects, like especially when you're mentioning now the 3D environments, uh, I often also use uh, 3D objects that I download from the internet. So there are different uh, websites where you can buy 3D objects. So I don't necessarily build every tiny detail myself. But uh, for example, when I'm working with 3D environments, the basic design of the landscape or the larger uh, elements, uh, I do that all myself. And it's usually the smaller stuff that I um, take from somewhere else. And, and now I would ask uh, several questions from my friends composers. Um, it's, uh, uh, but it's not, uh, those questions are asked to, uh, to any, to, to, uh, for everybody. And the first um, is from Simon Steen Anderson. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, he, his question is, what you fear as composers the most? Boredom. <laughs> uh, can you just a little bit elaborate what do you? Uh, well, I find this a very hard question, but I think uh... that you will bore uh, that you will be bored by something, right? Yes, I think what I'm most uh, afraid of uh, is uh, to kind of lose interest in uh, in uh, what I do. So far, it hasn't happened, but that's something what I imagine to be very unpleasant. Yes. Uh, second <laughs> question is from Franz uh, and His question is, why, you why do you still compose? Uh, it's in a way the inverse of the previous question. <laughs> I still find that there is so much to explore, but just keeps me curious. And I'm... Uh, I just really in, enjoy doing it uh, and I have the feeling there is still a lot to learn and especially there is so much to explore. So um, it just remains to be a fascinating field for myself. 
but I would really like to see composing also in a sort of larger context because, uh, as I said, I very often work uh, audiovisually, and I think that's uh, something what's very important for me also to keep the field in a way uh, fascinating for me personally. But I uh, definitely find it very exciting to explore how ideas that are maybe in their origin of a sort of musical nature uh, sort of leave the musical boundaries and transgress into other disciplines and media. And um, just looking back, right, uh, during this century, uh, what's, to your mind, what is the biggest uh, changes in musical landscape? I think the biggest change in the musical landscape uh, happened quite exactly around 25 years ago, and that's when laptops became able to produce audio, because this led to uh, an um, incredible democratization of the creation of music. Uh, software became accessible and things that otherwise you could do only in expensive and in accessible studios was suddenly available more or less well certainly not to everyone but definitely to a much larger part of the population and uh, first of all this completely changed the, the sort of landscape of electronic music um, there was uh, an incredible diversity which uh, emerged from that many different styles and um, I know that many people look at it in a very critical way because, uh, of course, like always, not all of that was good what was produced, but the enormous diversity is something that I personally uh, find very interesting and also something that I personally welcome a lot. And maybe what's also important is that this split is something um, uh, this development is something which uh, is really characteristic of electronic music and something which could not take place in the field of notated music in a similar way. Because uh, you could say that the accessibility uh, sort of uh, removed the boundaries and made it accessible for everybody, but with notated music it's uh, more complicated. Uh, it uh, remains more inaccessible because you have to be able to read music, uh, you have to be able to write music, but not only that, you have to know about instruments, what's the highest and lowest pitch of whatever instrument, and uh, how instruments behave in general, orchestration, all of that. So there are many more crafts that you have to learn in a sort of hard way which make um, instrumental composition more inaccessible than electronic music. But this has also led to a sort of, uh, when you look at the academic music, um, uh, a split has happened, I would say, because uh, the sort of academic electronic music and the academic contemporary music were very close together for about 40 years. And then through this um, democratization of electronic music, there has definitely been a development in the field of electronics, which simply didn't take place, in my opinion, in the field of notated music. And I think that this has a very strong impact um, if you look at the development of music in the last 25 years. Um, <clears throat> there is some kind of uh, notion which I, I have heard there is this this century is let's say it's very demanding is it uh, let's say demanding for musical innovation constantly from from composer and, and and one one feature how we can like observe it is that there is let's say less uh, idea of signature right so that, that you as a composer you shouldn't develop your own signature and repeat it uh, and, and build it but you, in contrast in, 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 I mean, do, do completely opposite uh, stuff so that you always need to be unpredictable, right? So that, uh, that uh, when somebody is seeing your, your piece, so that it always should be something surprising and, and I, these ideas that you cannot guess which piece is that. And 
what is your feeling? Is we are going somewhere there, so that it's let's let's say more, let's say more uh, more bigger surprises, uh, less let's say less less idea of some kind of musical signature for composer is important. I have to say I'm a little bit surprised about this. Uh point of view you just described because I have the feeling that uh, uh, almost the contrary is happening. I have the feeling that many composers, especially the successful ones, are have a, really a sort of recognizability so that uh, when you commission them a new piece, of course you can't predict exactly what's going to happen, but uh, usually it will not come as a big surprise. But uh, something what I uh, do find um, characteristic of our time is that uh, if you think of a sort of musical discourse as a whole, or you could say also a sort of musical scene, I think that this has become uh, much less uh, consistent. Uh, and with that, I mean that every composer nowadays has a slightly different set of references. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, 40 years ago, if you would go to a new music festival, I think that there would have been much more a sort of common sense of what are the most important pieces of the century, what are the most important questions uh, in music nowadays. And if you would go to a similar uh, festival nowadays, I think there would be a much larger diversity. So my feeling is that uh, the cultural landscape is sort of disintegrating, uh, in uh, that the musical discourses are disintegrating, and that um, almost every composer uh, manifests a sort of little patch in a patchwork of different discourses. So to speak more concretely, especially in the field of uh, composers who also expand their practices to other media, as I do, but also as many others do, everyone has a slightly different uh, frame of reference. So for example, if you think of somebody like uh, Yanis Kirikides, uh, for him the reference to text or film is uh, more significant, whereas in my case, it's now also this reference uh, to games, interaction, and so on. Uh, and um, this also means that we are sort of peeking into other discourses, into other scenes, into other traditions, into other histories, yes. uh, discourses which have developed in very different ways and so this in a way also uh, influences our way of working and I think that this leads to the sort of segmentation of uh, the discourse and making discourses as a whole less cohesive. Uh, I personally like that. I think that's a very exciting development. Uh, it could also of course be seen as something negative, as threatening because we're in a way losing a sort of common frame of reference but I think it's so, so something that feels appropriate for a time for me. And um, your observations, how audience change during this century? Musical audience or new music audience? Yeah, well, I find this very hard to answer because um, if I imagine that I would go to hear a piece, let's say at a Dono uh, Eschinger Musik Tage. I would meet a completely different audience than if I would go to hear the same piece at the Merz Music in Berlin. So <laughs> even if you stay sort of uh, within the same discourse, there can al already be a large variety of different audiences. If you then think of festivals like Club Transmediale or Vozar, which are uh, sort of stretching the boundaries even more, uh, you could still find the same names, uh, partly at least, presented there, but the audiences that uh, come with the festival or with the venue are again uh, a different one. So I maybe again there is a uh, nowadays a bit of a greater mixture than maybe 30 years ago, but I don't really dare to give a clear answer to the yes. question how the audience has changed. I, I wouldn't be able to tell.
and uh, how you think how like internet uh, do internet create some kind of let's say uh, global communities of new music or still it's very localized well my feeling is that uh, if you think of a uh, new music like in the post avant-garde sense i think that it is a uh, still in a way very much driven by festivals, so, which is quite unusual if you compare it to other um, uh, types of music, which are maybe much more dominated by labels or also uh, uh, internet distributions. But the post-avant-garde, uh, at least in the sort of German-speaking countries and maybe in Europe in general, the state uh, by uh, the gatekeepers and uh, the organ festivals mm -hmm. got it, got it. of course the internet has played a role here as well but uh, i think to a lesser part than in other musical discourses and uh, how you see uh, and what are the biggest uh, factors that, uh, which drives future now of, of new music of is it uh, still technology or is it uh, some social factors like decolonization or? Um, well, I think what I said earlier with the sort of disintegration of the discourses, I, I, I think that this is uh, something what is also going to uh, characterize the future in a way. And I think that uh, uh, I find it very hard to predict how this is going to evolve, uh, whether at a certain point everything will kind of get contracted again into more coherent discourses or whether uh, everything will become even more fluid. Uh, this is definitely an important aspect. And then, I mean, you mentioned diversity. I think uh, that this is definitely something which would also uh, go hand in hand with such a greater fluidity and uh, something which uh, would definitely be a very necessary development. Um, I think that the role of technology will uh, remain important, but uh, in my understanding, it's not so much the question of great novelties, great new gadgets and so on, but rather this sort of kind of ongoing question, what uh, technology means in our lives. And I think that this, in a way, has to be something which is echoed also in the artistic practice. And in that sense, I think it will remain important. And um, to your mind, uh, what, is, uh, what is the role of new, of new music in society? Well, this is something where, where uh, I have a maybe rather pessimistic view on, I think the role of society, if you look at society in a kind of larger context, I would say is almost non-existent. I, unfortunately, music is really uh, ex this sort of experimental or post-avant-garde music um, is really happening in a sort of niche. And if you would go out, uh, on the street and talk to somebody, I think most of the people wouldn't even know that this sort of music exists. So therefore, unfortunately, I think its uh, role in society is relatively small. But then maybe this is also not uh, such of relevance whether you reach a large society in a quantitative sense. So I think it's also fine to, to have those little niches where important things can be happening nevertheless. And what is your, what would be your guess, right? Um, what would be your smart guess? Because there are some composers who are saying that, uh, let's say, the status of academic music is decreasing. And, and that's why maybe, let's say, in 10, 15 or 20 years, it will have less uh, significant funding from government that it will be more like let's say like uh, hobby music as for example like electronic music right uh, or it oh, still I, I, remain a very high status and with very huge support from governments um 
I didn't understand how you're relating the question of funding to to academia. Because it is academic music, right? Yes. And at least uh, in Europe, and I think Latvia, in Latvia it's different, and I think in other Europe, so this music is heavily, classical academic music is heavily supported by, by, by cultural grants and etc. Yes. And the reason which, which it could be the case, at least uh, this uh, idea of François Charan, that it's due to the way that it was before that music was very like, high, academic music is high status music, right? Mm -hmm. And now we see a little bit uh, like devaluating the status, right? As you said, it become more niches and etc. Less, less, maybe relevant to to the audience, right? And then is the question whether like this situation somehow will not uh, we will not lead to some kind of decrease of uh, funding, or uh, or it will maybe turn like other musics which are not supported by it. electronic music is. Uh, not very supported by, uh, by by grammar by government funding or independent uh, music is seen as, as well is not so much su supported by governments as let's say academic music yes but um i think electronic music is also receiving uh, some funding but it depends on whether it's considered to be sort of uh, in the spirit of this sort of uh, academic uh, post-avant-garde, uh, that's correct. Um, I mean, uh, I don't see a problem with the niche because if you think of post-avant-garde or avant-garde music, it has been a niche already since uh, World War II. So this is nothing new. I think on the contrary, I think uh, also uh, through electronic music and the diversification and the uh, democratization of the electronic music production, I actually think that uh, uh, the situation is maybe even improving a little bit, uh, that it's uh, through these channels, people are kind of becoming more interested in experimental forms of music and through that maybe also forms of uh, post avant garde music. However, um, I think it's a, uh, the problem with the funding is a different one, that there is uh, more and more a sort of uh, neoliberal uh, model of economy applied to uh, uh, cultural funding, which I find a really a horrible mistake and a, a deep misunderstanding of what the purpose of cultural funding should be, because then the argument usually goes that uh, Funding is there to help people to get started until they can uh, basically uh, provide uh, for themselves. And uh, this is not what cultural funding should be about. Cultural funding should just uh, enable a large diversity of culture and support those fields who will probably never be able to support themselves. And so this neoliberal model, um, yeah, as I said, I think it's simply based on a misunderstanding of the purpose of cultural funding, and it might very well lead or has already led to also the extinction of certain developments. Um, do you consider yourself as multimedia music composer? Uh, yes, I would. I mean, usually I call myself an audiovisual composer, but uh, yeah, basically uh, I feel uh, okay with both, both descriptions. And uh, can you just explain to how you see, what's the definition of multimedia music? What would be your way how you would define it? Yeah. Um... I would rather like to describe it than to define it because to define something also means to kind of close and shield it off. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, for me, from my perspective, since I have a background in uh, composition, um, what I find characteristic about uh, my approach to multimedia is that in some way it uh, goes back to the idea that sound alone is not sufficient to express musical ideas and uh, not in general but in certain cases or you could also say in other words that uh, certain musical ideas can transgress 
the sonic so they can manifest in many different ways than just through sound and i personally uh, find it very interesting to explore such uh, combinations uh, of uh, different uh, disciplines and media mm -hmm. so the basic uh, so the basic change in paradigm right as i understand from you is so that uh, before uh, multi, uh, multimedia music, the music was mainly perceived as a sound, and now it's perceived as, uh, let's say, broader, right? So that music is not only what you hear, but what you see as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is, uh, I would say that this is a particular uh, approach to multimedia composition. I mean, multimedia, uh, opera is also, of course, a form of multimedia, but I think what, uh, uh, characterizes uh, the way how I approach it and also many colleagues I know is uh, this idea that uh, you're still maybe originating from a musical idea but you're not restricting it to, uh, necessarily to um, um, a sonic manifestation but in a way that it uh, stretches into the visuals or into the narrative or into uh, many other forms. And how uh, how did you start uh, uh, to compose multimedia music? What was the, your trigger to start it? Um, I had a fascination for uh, lighting and um, I started to work with lighting at first, uh, quite a long time before I started to work uh, with video, for example. And in the beginning, I really considered lighting to be a sort of inaudible musical voice. So I really thought a lot about lighting in musical terms, applying musical parameters to it, like rhythm, intensity, and so on. And in a way, this was my uh, starting point. Uh, I also eventually um, did a PhD uh, where I explored the relationship between lighting and musical composition. And uh, after I finished the PhD, I sort of felt, okay, I have to do the step also into the use of video. It's something which I sort of wanted to stay away from for a while, but then at a certain point, I noticed that uh, it is becoming a necessary step for me. And uh, Nowadays, I would say that uh, my approach to multimedia is definitely is more multifaceted than uh, at the beginning. But in the beginning, it was really this uh, idea of a sort of non-audible musical voice, which manifests at, as light. And, um, and for you, right? Uh, maybe not yours uh, pieces, but uh, not your pieces, but what would be your uh, three or four pieces, which which you would say is a very good example of multimedia music. Um, I usually don't really like it to kind of single out as uh, individual things, but um, um, I mean, there's uh, many different uh, developments which have taken place in this field. and. Uh, I would also think of some examples in experimental film or like in the sort of uh, experimental film in the um, area of uh, visual music, which uh, I find extremely interesting. And uh, well, to name a historic example, Stan Brackett, I find very fascinating although his films are silent, but I think that you can feel that he was uh, very strongly uh, kind of led by musical ideas also in the way how he uh, approached film. And um, then more recently, there are uh, also very interesting artists uh, working also in this field between club uh, uh, museum and uh, sort of academic music, uh, uh, like the Ojikuro Kava, for example, or um, <clears throat> a good friend of mine, Yanis Kirakidis, who I mentioned earlier, I also consider a very interesting audiovisual artist. So, yeah, 
these these are maybe a few examples yes yes and uh, could you imagine uh, because from my understanding right multimedia music wouldn't be impossible without uh, technological development right mainly hardware and software right because this is one of uh, uh, one uh, let's say one field of uh, academic music which couldn't be evolved without technological development yes i think that uh, during technological development made many things much more accessible and of course this makes it much easier especially for people who are not trained as programmers uh, like me or many colleagues to nevertheless use this technology so thank you very much marco for uh, uh, for uh, this interview thank you